It's Thanksgiving, and you know what that means. It means it's time for an arbitrary social pressure to have to be happy and joyful and celebratory. And if you're among those who genuinely feel those ways, that's fantastic. But there are many who see this time as a time of year that's difficult, challenging, and there's a combination of factors that go into this. There's the days getting shorter and shorter continually, and there's still nearly another month of that to go, which means that it's almost two months before it gets to where the days are as long as they are now. And considering that, and piling on top of that, the disruption in routines that occurs due to the holiday season, and especially if things that are part of what a person considers as stabilizing to their emotions or their well-being, being shifted around or canceled or in some way disrupted and messed with, And then add on to that the social pressure of, well, you're supposed to be happy and there's this elevated standard of how you're supposed to be able to conduct yourself. And I know that there was one year where I ruined Christmas. And so much of a large part of the argument that occurred occurred because of this idea that well, you can't have that objection on Christmas. And so that was received as like, well, you care more about your celebration than you do about my feelings, and I don't care what day of the year it is, why is what day of the year it is have anything to do with whether my feelings are valid or not? And the word condemn actually means to invalidate. So any measure that's taken where in some way you invalidate something or void it or render it as being worthless, that's what condemn actually means. So when you tell somebody that their problems are first world problems, you're condemning them. You're making their situation invalid. You're voiding it. You're telling them that their feelings are worthless to you. Or if you call somebody a snowflake or whatever other kind of insult that might mean that they're just weak and fragile. And that somehow it's shameful to be fragile. And anytime you do that kind of thing, what you're doing is you're voiding the person, you're invalidating their feelings. And by extension, what you're doing is saying, you're worthless to me because your feelings aren't meaningful to me. And if a person's feelings aren't meaningful to you, that's the expression of, you aren't meaningful to me. And this is a time of year that, in my own personal experience, for example, I was in the nut house on my 40th birthday, and my birthday always follows Thanksgiving shortly thereafter in this case, directly thereafter. But it's this time of year. And so it's a time of even that association, like ties into the, the identity of the season of going, well, this is the, th this is the season that sucks. And I'm pretty sure the other time I was in the nut house was during November as well, but I think a little bit earlier in November. 
So, I mean, that ends up creating an association that when I think of November, I think of those times. I think of the kinds of emotions and things that I was going through during those times. So it actually strengthens the notion that it's a difficult time of year. And to say to somebody that their feelings need to be suppressed because there happens to be a celebration is avoiding an invalidation of what it is that they're feeling. And that's something to be considered that compassion doesn't say you don't get to have those feelings today. In fact, it, it actually kind of reminds me of the Pharisees accusing Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. Because it was like as though they were saying, you have six days a week to do that. Don't do that on Saturday. And so it's like we say, you know, you have 360 days a year that aren't one of our arbitrary holidays. Don't have that feeling or express that complaint or be in that state on Thanksgiving, Christmas, whatever the holiday is, Easter. So it's a prohibition that's imposed upon people regarding something that's really not even necessarily under their control. And I think one of the one of the things I most find repulsive and abhorrent is a philosophy that I call your life is your fault. And that's what's commonly expressed in things like law of attraction, word of faith, which is just Christianese for law of attraction. They're exactly the same thing, one with a Christian label. And other kinds of ideas like this that say your life is your own fault. And by fault, I'm indicating also something that would be to your own credit. And uh, it actually reminds me of a passage in Deuteronomy that says something about, uh, you know, unless you think that the prosperity that you have is by the work of your own hands. And, I, you know, that is a kind of passage that probably gets used as telling people that they're required to tithe, but really what it has to do with is, is saying, consider the number of circumstances that went into something. Maybe it's not appropriate to take credit for your own achievement. Because if you think about it, where you were born, when you were born, what kind of characteristics and attributes you have, whether you were raised in a environment that cultivated your natural inclinations, the things that, for which you are naturally equipped, or whether you were raised in an environment that said those natural inclinations that you have and the things for which you are naturally equipped are to be avoided. And here's the kind of way that you're supposed to be. And I can relate to that because... I just seem to feel like a lot of things in terms of my natural characteristics were not encouraged as something to be valued. And even perhaps taken to the extent of saying like, that's something to be ashamed of or to change or to be avoided. And I just... I really can't stand the whole... I I can't stand motivational speakers. So first of all, you have the fact that motivation is the opposite of inspiration. 
inspiration is when you feel this compulsion to this internal drive that you really can't suppress or it takes effort to suppress if if you do suppress it to do something it's it's what you just utterly feel an impulse and compulsion to do you're driven to do to do it just because it's what you're suited to do it's what you're equipped to do it's what you're inclined to do whereas motivation is when you push yourself into something that you're not feeling naturally inclined to do. And so motivational speakers go out there and while it may seem on the surface like the message is one of encouragement, it's really not. It's one of condemnation, invalidation. Uh, it's it's law, it's legalism, it's setting up a standard that you can't achieve after which you feel worthless for failure to achieve that standard. So for example, I saw something where it said something about uh, Matt Damon and Ben Affleck, and all they had was their jalopy and a dream, and they made it work. And then it said something like, what's your excuse? Well, first of all, my excuse is I don't have any fucking ambition whatsoever. In fact, I'm actually a little bitter and resentful at having been born. So how about that for a start for what my excuse is? I don't have a dream. And so these kinds of things set up for people to say, okay, well, I'm a failure. Because they had nothing and they had a dream and they pursued it and were successful in achieving that particular goal. Whether that was a meaningful goal or not is another discussion. But the whole entire principle is to say, you're a failure and it's your fault. You're, you are the reason that you are a failure. And maybe it's because those things that I felt naturally inclined to do when I was younger were things that were either were either wickedness from some superstitious religious stupidity or were you know boys don't that's not how boys are or some other other bullshit and so then even when it came to school, like I was taught very early on, don't work ahead and let the other children answer. So when it even came to something that I would have had a socially acceptable ability to achieve in it, that was just crushed at an age that I really didn't know any better. In fact, I was probably about 30 years old before I actually realized I enjoy learning. That's how sour it put me off to, to education. And so, I mean, I never pursued any higher degree or field of study because I had no fucking ambition whatsoever. I really just, I was glad to be out of school and I wasn't, qualified really to do anything and I didn't learn to become qualified to do anything because I fucking hated learning or at least that was what I thought these things matter like to teach children that there's something wrong with them or to invalidate their natural impulses and we have this stupid, I call it the Henry Ford mass production assembly line education system. We figured that at some point, somebody figured that if you could mass produce products and you could mass produce written information, which is the printing press, that you can mass produce education. And so we invented this stupid system where we think that we can mass produce an outcome. And then we treat just like an assembly line, we treat those that don't conform as defective. Rather than saying, you know, everyone's an individual. And 
prior to this in history, the way that you learned was through some sort of an apprenticeship, for example. And it would be pretty intimately suited to whatever you were doing, including going, you know what, I'm not sure you're suited to this particular kind of occupation. Here's somebody else you might want to talk to regarding something I think maybe you are suited towards, or at least if you were dealing with a compassionate person. If it was an uncompassionate person, they might have just said, you know, you're worthless, take a hike. But the point being that you actually learn to do something through a model that's more similar to apprenticeship than this stupid concept we have of here's a bunch of information and then we're going to examine you on whether you've stuffed that information into your short-term memorization in order to pass an exam. The whole entire system is stupid. And it really is based on the idea of mass producing a result. I can't stand when I see things about, oh, in such and such country, China or wherever, like, look at the, look at the numbers of people that are in math or science or whatever that we have imposed some arbitrary fictional value on, like, it, the whole thing just devalues arts. It devalues music. It devalues art. It devalues poetry. And this is exactly the same kind of thing that we have with an approach to the Bible is to say, well, if it's not factually accurate and historical, then it's fucking worthless. Because the other approach is to say, well, it's literary. And then people say, oh, so it's just a stupid story. That's the low view that we have of literature is they're just stupid stories. They don't mean anything. Oh, so you're saying the Bible's no better than Alice in Wonderland. Why are you thinking so little of Alice in Wonderland? That's my question. Why the low view of literature? Why so degrading to the arts? Why so degrading to the things that actually express the human condition and bind people together and going, you know what, the way that person just expressed that idea was amazing and really resonated with me. And we've substituted it with this stupid concept of the facts will make you free. That we've substituted truth and wisdom and literature and meaning and poetry with facts. And this stupid Gnostic concept that you will know the facts and the facts will make you free. And that's what the, the fundamentalist atheists who say, well, you, you, you're all a bunch of morons who believe in a fictional story because you don't know the facts. And so you got to get the facts and the facts will make you free. Or the flat earthers who say you're under some deception. So you got to get the facts. And when you get the facts, the facts will make you free. Or Christianity that says, well, if you understand that this is the factual, factually accurate version of how God created everything and who God is, then that will make you free. Or the conspiracy theorists who say, if you understood the facts about what the government was doing then the facts would make you free the whole entire concept it's all the same fucking religion global warming oh you will know the facts and the facts will make you free no the facts will not make you free a higher value and a higher view of things like literature will make you free when you understand meaningful stories that you can insert yourself into and you can vicariously experience what the characters are experiencing and you can learn from their experience, you can learn from an experience that you didn't actually have to live out, then you don't have to live it out. And that's how you learn empathy. You learn empathy by being able to resonate with what a character experiences in a story so that when someone tells you their story, you know how to relate to that. Because you've had practice in literature. So, when we come to the concept of your life is your fault... That's what Jesus dealt with, with 
you know, why is this man blind? Who sinned, him or his parents? Well, obviously his blindness was either his fault or his parents' fault. And the Pharisees walked around thinking that their prosperity was their fault, or rather to their credit. We're prosperous because God loves them, loves us, and they're not prosperous because God doesn't love them because they're sinners. And then we have the word of faith bullshit that says, oh, well, it's because you didn't name it and claim it properly. You know, or or whatever it is, they, they'll find some loophole where it's your fault that you're not, that the, the formula that they're trying to sell you doesn't fucking work because it doesn't fucking work. The reason it doesn't work is because it doesn't work. Period. End of story. That's why people need to invent things like afterlife heaven and afterlife hell is because they realize how much what goes around doesn't ever come around. It doesn't work. And so Jesus says, no, it's not his fault or his parents' fault that he's blind. Sometimes shit just fucking happens. Sometimes sometimes things are just the way they are and circumstances are what those circumstances are. I saw another thing that said something like, like, make the choice. So, so now it's putting, it's your responsibility. Make the choice to be happy and see the good in life. I'm doing this the best I can recall. Make the choice to be happy and see the good in life and make the choice not to be unhappy and see the bad in life. I know that's not exactly what it was, but my response was, you know, I spent the vast majority of 40 some years wanting to see the good and enjoy life and only seeing the bad and hating life. What I was getting was utterly contrary to what I wanted. So it wasn't about the choice that I was making. And I'm sure I'm not alone in being the only person that thinks, why can't I be more optimistic? Why can't I be more ambitious? Why can't I be less sensitive to these things? Why can't, whatever it is, whatever characteristic it is to say, why can't I be different than I am so I can be socially acceptable? So I can fall into that range of the thing that's supposed to be socially acceptable to everybody, where they say, your life is your fault. whether it's first world problems, suck it up, snowflake, or whatever bullshit that people want to throw at you, what's your excuse? It's all the same bullshit of your life is your fault. It's totally callous and compassionateless, and it's exactly what the Pharisees were guilty of doing. The reason why they were criticized for not helping the needy is because they had the view that their condition was their fault. And therefore, since the person was in their state of need because they were a filthy, disgusting sinner that God was punishing, the worst thing you could possibly do was violate the will of God. That's why there's mentions of the will of God. Violate the will of God by helping the needy because the will of God is for them to be suffering. When that's what you think is that the will of God is for the suffering people to be suffering, that they've earned it, that it's their fault, that it is the punishment of God imposed upon them, then the worst thing you could possibly do is, is rebel against God and help those he's punishing and help them escape the punishment that they're being imposed upon by their filthy sinnerhood. And I personally think that even when it comes to the few times that the text tells us that Jesus said something about sitting with sinners or whatever, like uh, angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner coming to repentance or some such, I think there was a lot of 
So let's let's think about this. We treat the text as though Jesus had no sense of humor. Like it's it's this stupid concept of the Bible is basic instructions before leaving earth, but there's nothing basic about it. It's not an instruction book and it has nothing to do with what happens to you after you die. So there's, there's uh, three strikes you're out on B I B L E being basic instructions before leaving earth. But that's why as soon as you say like, Oh, this is literary or this is allegorical, or this is just an illustration of something people say, well then how am I supposed to know? Because it's not instructions. But if it is instructions and you can't take the instructions literally, then you you, you are in a probably a, a difficult spot. You know, if if I'm supposed to follow instructions on doing something, and I get to an instruction that's symbolic, I'm probably going to have a difficult time following those instructions. It's also not basic, or there wouldn't be however many ridiculous number of denominations there are. I'm suspicious of quite a few numbers, but I know that there's a lot. So, obviously, it's not basic. There is no plain interpretation of the text. That's a completely fictional and and ridiculous idea. So from that, then we get this idea like everything is an instruction. So it's a clear instruction. And obviously you don't give instructions if you're actually good at giving instructions. You don't give instructions sarcastically. So when Jesus (laughs) clearly with a biting sarcasm says, if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. People really think, oh, he's upping the standard of the law and telling them that they're not really keeping the law. No, actually, he's telling them how stupid keeping the law is. Because he's saying, look, your hand doesn't cause you to sin, moron. If I punch you in the face, it's not my hand's fault. There's something about the intent of my heart and the enmity that I harbor towards you that made me want to punch you in the face. And if I cut off my hand, it's not going to stop me from having that enmity towards you. Because I could still kick you or shove you or hire somebody to do something to you or just abuse you with my words. Nothing whatsoever about cutting off my hand has addressed the actual intent of my heart that caused the hatred that I have for you. The, the, the whole point is your body parts don't cause you to sin, but because of this stupid Gnostic dualism, asceticism, the body is evil and the spirit is good view that we have of the world that we've inherited from really from the Greek uh, uh, tradition and the Gnostic tradition. We've got this idea that the body does cause you to sin. That the body is corrupt and the bodily functions are corrupt and disgusting and defiling. Muslims even take it to the extent where, like, if you urinate, you have to make sure that you urinate in such a manner that it doesn't splatter onto you or you've defiled your body. I mean, that's, that's a quite extreme measure of it. And it's rooted in this idea that your body is disgusting. That your body is abhorrent. And that what you are by nature is wrong. It's just like I say about how my view of myself all through life was that there's something fundamentally wrong with being me. So I don't really know where I'm going with this. But I just want people to understand and have a little compassion for the fact that not everyone necessarily is going to be saying, yay, happy Thanksgiving, hey, Merry Christmas, and feeling genuine about it. That maybe even if they are saying those things, it's the mask that they wear to be socially acceptable.
And rather than invalidate those feelings and void them, I want to show some empathy and compassion and say, I know where that is. I know that place. I know what it's like to feel those things. And I know what it's like to have somebody void that from you. And to say, not today. You don't get to have those feelings today. Or if you do, you need to shove it down and suppress it. So what I'm saying is, maybe what we should really be doing rather than valuing joyfulness and celebratory experience maybe there can be a value in saying somebody that isn't in that place maybe I should go find the place they're in I just thought of a the whole concept of where it said rather than give a person a fish teach the person to fish because if you give them a fish you give them one meal if you teach them to fish you feed them for a lifetime but really we don't do either we basically have this social agenda especially with the name it and claim it and law of attraction bullshit and motivational speakers that really what we say is why are you sitting on your ass what's your excuse why aren't you out there fishing and so then somebody goes out there and takes a stab at it and we say well the problem is you gave up too soon well maybe giving up on something you're not suited to doing is exactly the right course of action Maybe being driven by the things that you are suited to doing is the right course of action. But maybe that's been taken away from you at a stage where you didn't really understand. So maybe you're left thinking, there's nothing I'm suited to doing. Maybe rather than abusing people for giving up, we can do something for them as it is written cast all your cares on him because he cares for you if someone cares for you they're doing something on your behalf but instead we say you know get up suck it up what's your excuse make the choice about things that may well not be choices My kidney can't just decide to circulate the blood. If my heart's not doing that for the kidney, the kidney's every bit as screwed as the heart is, and every other part. It can't make that decision because it's not what it was designed to do. It's not what it's suited to do. It's not what it's equipped to do. And if we're really going to understand that we're many members of one body, we need to understand that there's things that others aren't suited to do. And just because the heart is suited to circulate blood doesn't mean other parts are. And I also think of a story I heard, something about uh, the hands did their work and the feet did their work, but they objected that the stomach just sat there doing nothing. And so they said, we're not going to support the stomach. So they didn't give it food because the stomach doesn't work for its food like the hands and feet do. And as a result, the whole body became weak. Because really, the hands and feet were just ignorant of what the stomach was doing and thought that it was useless but maybe it wasn't and so out of their ignorance they harmed themselves and that's exactly what it means to understand that we're all one body 
is to understand that the perspective you have and the abilities that you have might be different from somebody else. And that it's not necessarily wrong or a limitation that they don't have the same attributes. And it's certainly not something to shame them about that their function in life is different than yours. So my exhortation here on this Thanksgiving is to consider the other perspective and to consider being compassionate towards that perspective and maybe saying something more like I'm interested in understanding what it is that you're expressing here rather than something like, not today. You don't get to be that way today because it's whatever holiday it is. You got six days a week to heal, Jesus. Don't do it on Saturday. <laughs>